To kick off our conversation on local leadership and inclusive growth, please welcome former mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu. Wow. Hello, Madam Secretary. I didn't know you were going to be here. I would have come earlier. How are you? Thank you for MasterCard and for Aspen for having me here, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Um, just a couple of comments. I was able to listen to a couple of, um, of the panels this morning. I heard the panel that Arnie was on and, of course, the panel that Josh and, and uh, the ambassador were on. And it just occurred to me, I like the title, but it's real simple. If there's no inclusion, there's not going to be any growth. That's the long term. And that is a truism. It's a truth. The other thing is it's hard to have upward mobility when the system has a foot on your throat. You hear that a lot. So this morning I woke up in the city of New Orleans in the middle of a beautiful place, but I drove through the neighborhoods to get to the airport to fly into National, got out of National, came across the bridge and was able to look at this very beautiful city that looks so nice and so clean and so wealthy. And it felt so very far away from where I started. And I think that's something for all of us here today to think about. I want to tell you that there's no doubt that in America right now there's a divide. Sometimes it's an invisible line. Sometimes the line is not so invisible. In fact, in New Orleans, we can live a block away from each other and a world apart. In a lot of the neighborhoods that we live in, sometimes it's an invisible line, sometimes it's a railroad line, sometimes it's a river, sometimes it's a gate, sometimes it's a wall. But there's always a line between the communities that have and the communities that don't. And as I was driving here this morning, I was thinking about a neighborhood in the city of New Orleans called Central City. It's an inner city neighborhood, primarily African American. It's known for Mardi Gras for second lines, but it's also known for poverty and for violence. The average household income is about $36,000. It hosts a square block where the total dollars spent on incarcerating some of its residents is a million dollars. In other words, it has a prison, a school to prison pipeline. And literally a couple of blocks away, Madeline, you know this because you were on this avenue not long ago, St. Charles Avenue that divides a part of the city from the next, but it's where all the Mardi Gras parades go down because we have something called the neutral ground. Right across that avenue is another neighborhood, mostly African um, white. It has the garden district, beautiful big homes. The uh, income there is $128,000 more than four times and right across the street. Now during Mardi Gras, all the kids from both neighborhoods come out on the St. Charles Avenue, the parades come down the street. Little boys and girls, African American and white, enjoy themselves, they love the parade, they have a good time, they watch the bands go by, they catch beads, and then the sun sets and they go back to their very separate lives. One of them that leads them maybe to low level jobs in the hospitality industry and out of prison, others that lead you to Ivy League institutions like Tulane University or to Harvard or you know the rest. And so as this image is in my head as the mayor, I said, I don't understand how it is that in a city like New Orleans, or really anywhere in America, it could be Chicago on the south side that Arnie was talking about earlier today. It could be St. Louis. It could be D.C. a couple years ago before lots of folks came in and other folks had to go. Oh, you, I would say in nuance, are you feeling me now? <laughs> how is it that we remain a block away but a world apart? In a city like New Orleans, in a post-Katrina boom, how is it possible that in a city that's 64% African-American, that half of the African-American men, 39,600, are not working? How is it possible that new jobs are coming in, but we can't connect them? And that seems to be the challenge that we have. And so, as I said, geograph geography shouldn't be destiny. And it, it shouldn't be a situation where some of the largest employers are actually within a stone's throw of where people live. And I think this is a challenge for us, and that's where our economic opportunity came from. So I asked our team to figure out what the barriers were, wholesale and retail, how we were going to connect people to jobs. So we talked to CEOs and we brought them in. We also, who basically said that we have a worker shortage. And then when you went in the neighborhood and talked to the men, they said, we got a job shortage. There was a communication problem here at the beginning, but it was an institutional problem that we hadn't fixed. So we started something called the, the Anchor Institution Strategy, or I call it the High Noon Strategy. And it was pretty simple. At high noon, when the sun was shining at its brightest, 
wherever the shadow of that business cast, everybody that lives in that neighborhood ought to be working in that building. It was kind of a simple way of saying that you have to be an integral part of the neighborhood. So just a minute ago when Josh and those guys, and by the way, kudos to the business round table for saying something that's long overdue, which is that shareholder interest in the short term is not the best way for America to be an inclusive growth society. If you're not thinking about the neighborhood that you live in, the people who are working there, then in the short term you might get better, but in the long term, again, as I started off, if you don't have inclusion, you don't have growth. And so we actually started to think about what are the really specific things that you have to do in terms of job training, worker identification, breaking down the barriers to actually make sure that you include people in an intentional way who not only need help but actually live in the communities because if you're not a part of the community, then you're not a part of the community. And that's where isolation and alienation comes from that begins to manifest itself politically, economically, and then on a policy perspective. In the city of New Orleans, we had to change the rules for people that were doing business with us. All the billions of dollars that the city was spending, we asked them, tell me about your hiring practice. Tell me whether you ban the box. Tell me about your training programs. Tell me whether or not you have incentives to hire minority businesses. What's your equity portfolio look like? Who are you buying and selling your paper from? Who's doing your transportation? Who's doing all the work in accounting? Do you really mean what it is that you say when you say that you want to be inclusive, not just in your philanthropy, in giving little bits of your money, although it's a wonderful thing to do to give things away, but in terms of the total amount of where your in impact can be, what are all the major businesses doing in terms of their spending power, and how does that actually work? Now, we have major gaps still in the city of New Orleans, but after we started really working on it, after we brought in the not-for-profit sectors, after we brought in the for-profit sectors, after we brought in the training programs, and actually we started to mean it, we began to put people back to work. But at the end of the day, let me say this. Um, we are the greatest country on the globe, and we have to find a better way for upward mobility for everybody in this country, which means that you have to want, you have to understand that diversity is a strength, not a weakness. If you believe that diversity is a weakness, in my opinion, ball game is over. Every institution that I've seen in my life that has grown more inclusive, I mean more exclusive, has grown smaller and has atrophied. And that, in fact, is going to happen. And I, I would argue to you that I think that, what business, that is what business is beginning to see and understand, given the demographic changes and the demand to have a more equitable, inclusive community. And in the city of New Orleans, I have to say that the future can only be bright if we embrace inclusion. I don't think it belongs to a place that closes itself off to young African-American men and women. It doesn't belong to a place where immigrant families and everybody else has to work three or four jobs just to make ends meet, pay taxes, and still afraid of being grabbed and thrown out of the country. The future doesn't belong to a country where middle class men and women in Appalachia or the Midwest are being left behind by an economy that feels rigs and rewards only a few. Just a couple of hours ago, before this conference started, there was a settlement in Cleveland, Ohio, on the opioid crisis where hundreds of thousands of people have been laid to bear. You could drive through Appalachia right now and see the devastation from the opioid addiction that we never took care of. Can you imagine talking to somebody that has been addicted for a long time about upward mobility? Not a great conversation to have. And so I know that the places, the towns, the cities, the counties, the states, and really the countries that are going to attract people, create jobs and grow wealth and give our kids a better life are places that are open, that are tolerant, that are inclusive, that actually believe that diversity is a great strength, not a weakness. Now, I spoke a little bit earlier about what companies can do retail, where they spend their money, do they have an equity agenda, who do they contract with, all of those things are critically important. You're going to hear some people come up here and talk about specific things like opportunity zones or expanding the earned income tax credit. All of those things are critically important. But at the end of the day, our country is the way it is because we designed it this way. And it's functioning as it was designed. And I think that what we're going to find out is that it was designed that way either through really terrible neglect or on purpose. And unless we get through the issue of race, unless we get through the issue of otherness, unless we really believe that when other people come into our ambit, we're going to do better, we're not going to do better. That's just the way it's going to be. And if you want to build up with mobility, you have to change the institutions. And the institutions that have to be changed are really all of them. 
How do you expect people to get to work if the trains and the buses don't run on time or the roads and the bridges don't work or the water system doesn't give you clean water? How do you expect us to figure out how to integrate our community if we don't have long-term immigration reform? How do you expect anybody in America, much less everybody that's working in the inner cities if they're having difficulty with opioids or the criminal justice system when we think it's just a public safety threat, not a public health threat? All of these things are massive oppressors of how people get lifted up. Healthcare is another issue. I mean, this is not really complicated. It's just hard. And those are different things, my friends. And so sometimes you have to do what's hard for the sake of doing what's right. And unfortunately, in this country, we've kind of shied away from making the hard choices that are going to prepare us for the future. I think there's a lot of evidence that you can win in the short term if you got the numbers. But in the long term, you're going to lose. We already know what the prescription for success is, and that's in including everybody. And so as I would just leave you today, your mama told you this, right? I mean, we're going to win when people are healthy, when people are wealthy, and people are wise. And people get healthy by having access to health care. They get wise by having good education and training programs. And that's what builds economic growth and wealth that includes everybody. And so I would just encourage you to not just think about the small retail things that are all important. The tax structure is really important and what it gives incentives to and what it doesn't. Opportunity zones are important. But if the gravamen of what it is that we do is designed to just bring a couple of people along a little bit at a time so other people can get far ahead and leave everybody behind, then that's the way the country will be. But if you want it to be another way, you have to acknowledge that the way it's designed is broken and it's up to everybody in this room to fix it. Thank you so much. Good to be with you.